the song we're talking about this weekend. We're talking about an all-loving God. So say it with me. So, what is love? How are we supposed to define that? Well, we could call a friend. Hey Siri, call Glenn. We'll see if he answers. Hey, it's Marissa. So I'm in the middle of a message and I need some help answering this question. I was hoping that you could help me. The question is this, what is love? street. Some other definitions that I'll share with you are not quite as bucky as that. <laughs> Love is sharing your food. Love is when you'd rather spend time with them than be by yourself. Love is warm, happy feelings someone who can cheer you up more than ice cream or cookies. And I don't know about you, but someone who can cheer me up more than ice cream or cookies, that's a keeper. Do I cheer you up more than ice cream and cookies? Yeah. Oh, I made it. Thanks to all the friends who contribute to the social and understanding, but we're going to also understand this through a biblical lens. Because there's more to the picture than just humans loving humans. And let's read this passage together from 1 Corinthians. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag and it is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. It does not keep an account of a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Whew, do you feel the difference in those? This one, is, it's definitely heavier. But with that heaviness comes sturdiness. And that's our first stop on this journey. Because moving from a social to a biblical understanding of love means moving from self-focused to others-focused. Love, according to what we hear here in Corinthians, is not as much about what love can do for me as much as what I can do for you, the person I love. And this is not to say, to be clear, that we shouldn't receive things in return. The image I always come back to when I think about love, especially like in marriage or in like two-person relationships, is two exuberant fountains overflowing into the same pool. They're always giving, always receiving, pouring out and taking in. And when we're all giving, we all receive. That's the beautiful thing that I see about biblical love. And something Tim Mackey says is, the more I give, the more human I get. So that's love. Yay. Let's talk now about all loving, which immediately seems much heavier. <laughs> like, you know, I can socially love every day. I biblically love some people some of the time, but 
to sacrificially truly love everyone all the time that seems way too much of a burden for me a human i'll leave that to you god uh, but when we talk about an all-loving god immediately what comes to mind for me is jesus all human dying a death on the cross for people who didn't love him back and th that's the very picture of all loving which really tells me that we can be loving we can show this love to others but the problem that is always intertwined with the love of god is the existence of pain this is a question that stumps believers and non-believers alike how can an all loving all powerful god allow there to be pain and suffering in the world. And it's a good argument, honestly, because emotionally it doesn't make any sense that there should be pain in this world that a good God is said to reside over. But this problem that we're dealing with, the one of, of pain and of love, the real problem is freedom. Because real love requires real freedom, the real choice to choose and to be chosen and to choose to not love which it turns out is a really much easier decision to make not to love than to love because let's face it i mean loving someone is a lot of work it's a lot of work <laughs> but this this love this freedom this freedom that also invites the possibility of evil. It invites the possibility of real, not dictated, not predetermined, and not unquestionable, but chosen, faithful, autonomous love. And so in the end, it seems like our world was created by a being with the desire to love and to be loved high stakes, high reward love. I mean, without the risk of losing, is it really worth playing the game? Is the game I played this game of love? You love me if you wash the dishes. You don't love me if you forgot to vacuum the living room. Is that a game I learned to play from the God who made the game? I learned it by watching you. Is it really that God so desired to be loved that they created an elaborate game? <sighs> but someone else refused to play the game. Someone else threw the game away altogether and said, there's a better way. Let's read this. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates their own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If there ever was a game, the rules are pretty stacked for and not against us. The house always wins, as they say, but what if God created the house for us? And I came across this quote from N.T. Wright that really struck me as so profound with this idea of pain and of love. Jesus doesn't give an explanation for the pain and sorrow of the world. He comes where the pain is most acute and takes it upon himself. Jesus doesn't explain why there's suffering, illness, and death in the world. He brings healing and hope. He doesn't allow the problem of evil to be the subject of a seminar. He allows evil to do its worst to him. He exhausts it, drains its power, and emerges with new life. Now, well, now it's our turn. It's our turn to choose 
not to play the game. To choose a real love for real people. Because God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And keep in mind that no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. To cap things off, we're gonna go over 1 Corinthians again, but this time I want you to close your eyes. This time I want you to just listen to the questions and allow yourself to think of one or two people that the Holy Spirit is pressing on your mind and your heart to love a real love, to choose and to give your attention to, to not play the game with. Who did you lose your patience with? Who were you unkind to? Who did you find yourself unable to celebrate? When did you talk far too much about yourself? Who do you think you're so much better than? Whose priorities did you ignore in favor of your own? Who did you back out on? Who have you given up believing in or hoping for? Who can you offer a little more patience to? Who can you gift more kindness to? Who can you celebrate? Who can you be curious about? Who can you seek to understand? Where can you recognize another person's genius? Whose needs can you put before your own comfort? Who can you support? Who can you believe in? Who can you hope for?